All right, I will now call to order the City of Newburgh Budget Committee meeting of May 3rd, May 10th, 2023. Sue, will you please conduct a roll call? Yes, Madam Chair. Derek Carmen. Here. Mike McBride. Here. Robin Wheatley. Here. Um, Molly Olson. Here. Peggy Kilberg. Here. Elise Yarnell Holloman. Here. Bill Rosacker. Here. Lily Bazoo. Here. Steph St. Cyr. Here. Theodore Ibora. Here. <clears throat> Alex Nichols. Here. Judy Brown. Here. Greg Minahan. Raquel Here. Peregrino de Brito. Here. And Lizelle Mathai. All right. Uh, now that we have that completed, we now have uh, approval of minutes. Sue, is there any minutes to approve? Unfortunately, due to the timing of my vacation, <laughs> there are not. So it'll be next week. My apologies. Thank you for that. No problem. Now, tonight we'll be continuing with the budget where we left off, and that's around page 57. Well, I will now turn it over to Finance Director Katie Strode for st staff presentations. Thank you. So we're going to start with our public safety funds. And I have the chief up here with me. So we're going to start with our fund three, the civil forfeiture fund. Did you want to talk about that? Sure. Uh, my name is Jeff Cosmic. I'm chief of police for the Newburgh Dundee Police Department. Um, fund three is very simple. It's just any kind of forfeiture that we uh, encounter during police activity. Um, it can be either through uh, civil forfeiture, which there's a formula that the state requires we follow. Um, any of the anything that is forfeited cash wise or or uh, goods is put into this this uh, fund to keep it separately. It's required. That's really about it. Yeah, it's pretty simple. We don't have a lot of forfeitures anymore just because of measure 110 has kind of taken away some of those, but we do have some that do come in every once in a while. So it's pretty low balance. Um, does anybody have any questions on? I do. Uh, I see that there's a big jump in the number from 482 from last year. I'm sorry, for from 425 to 5,054 and um, beginning. So that is just the beginning of it, right? So that's probably an old case that finally got worked through the, the, uh, the court systems. Okay. Um, we'll still have some more, um, you know, a lot. I wouldn't say a lot. I'd say a good portion over half uh, used to come from when when uh, narcotics were illegal or drugs were illegal. And so it was it was a common practice to seize proceeds and put that into this account. I don't see that really. I see that being less active okay. uh, with the current laws. Thank you. What does this get used for, Chief? It's restricted. Uh, you can use it for equipment. Well, typically, uh, it also depends on the state or federal. And so Katie's team keeps all that stuff very squared away and straight. It's, it's together but separate um, because it all goes into one fund. But uh, federal funds, you don't have to share. Uh, state funds, you do have to share. There's a formula where we only keep 40%. The rest of the 60% goes is dispersed throughout uh, state programs. Um, did I answer your question? Okay. Okay, let's move on to fund 13, the 911 tax fund. So for the resources in here, because we have a dispatch center, this is part of the state shared revenue. So we get a percentage from the, the revenue that's collected from the state. So these numbers are driven by the state numbers that we're going to get based on their apportionment on that. And then it covers, I believe, three dispatchers that we have in here. And it's the same for the 
metrics that we had for the general fund for police, it's a 7% COLA with the same health insurance and PERS increases as well. Does anybody have any questions on this one? I do. Um, this doesn't mean that I'm opposed to it. I'm just curious. The increase in dispatch salaries year over year, what I'm what was it? Are you paying them a lot more or? Uh, well, actually for this one, so last year we had a huge turnover in dispatch. So there were several vacant positions, some of them okay. which landed in this one. We've kind of had a new plan now to put our more senior staff into this fund to kind of preserve general fund dollars a little bit more. Okay. So that's probably why you see a little bit of a jump here. Got it. And um, another question. So from the adopted from last year, the excise taxes was 305,000 and now it's 424,000. And um, is that like kind of to match the actual of 2021, 22? Yeah, um, sometimes with the state's prediction for what you're going to get for their share, sometimes they're off from what they think. So we actually ended up getting closer to 412 okay. this year. So I based their estimate off of what we actually received. Got it. Katie, where do uh, the miscellaneous revenues come from? What is it? It's well, yeah, last year it was almost 5,000. This year it's 2,000. And I think sometimes we just budget in case we get miscellaneous um, uncollected revenues from property taxes. Sometimes those can come in. We didn't actually receive anything this year. It just was budgeted in case we did. Okay, if no other questions, we'll move on to Fund 16, the Public Safety Fund. So the Public Safety Fund covers uh, a fee for uh, police officers and then a fee for dispatch officers as well. And those are linked to um, a CPIU index. So that's the increase on those for the revenues. And some of those were also kind of trued up based on what we actually received. So those are related to the fees that you see on your municipal utility billing statement. So each person will pay a fee towards funding police officers and dispatchers. So in here, we have three police officers and two dispatchers that are paid for in here. And then in this fund, uh, we do the opposite. We try to keep the least expensive yeah. uh, officers uh, and dispatchers in these funds uh, so that 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 doesn't swap that fund that comes on your, on your municipal bill. We try to keep that as low as possible. That's a different strategy. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I think I understand this right, but the current rates we're seeing on our municipal bills will not go up July 1? They will. They will July 1. Yes. I was thinking it was a January. Okay. Um, any way to put a number to those? Um, I believe it's linked to the CPIU West, which I think was a 6.4% increase. In real dollars, uh, we are projecting at $6.36 a month. How many? Yeah, for both, for both. For both fees. How many EDUs are in Newburgh in total at this point? When you say ED, are you asking like how we derive the number? Yeah, like how many dwelling units are contributing to the to the fund? Just out of curiosity. I know that there's growth over time, but what's the current number? I will have to get that for you. Um, we have different metrics. So um, bigger meter size pay a larger fee. And so that also pay like CPRD has a larger, has like the largest meter and they pay a larger fee based on meter size but i can get you the breakdown for that oh, thank you yeah you could do some crazy math with the average 2.5 people per domicile and the population count twenty five thousand. that would give you a very approximate number oh, of course. <clears throat> um regarding um sort of full employment at the at in the department i understand that it's 
been very difficult to hire uh, police officers and that and and now this is, this is my I think my second or third year now on the budget committee and and I don't think you've been at full employment in a, in a given year yet um, so when you have an unfilled position that's going to contribute to a fund balance somewhere and I'm wondering you know how do you what fund balance are we talking about and and given that you're now rolling over fund balances for departments this is a substantial amount of money that's going to accumulate um for this one in particular last year when we I think it was last year when we adopted the the change so previously the public safety fee hadn't had any sort of increase since it's um since it was introduced onto the municipal statement and even though that hadn't increased salaries for police officers had continued to increase so it wasn't able to fund the three officers that it was originally designed so when we brought it back to council we put an inflationary cost on it because the fund was almost out of money so even with just the two officers and so we kind of cut back a little bit last year trying to put back a fund balance in there again because you know it's it's very hard to know what we're going to hire some of our laterals can come in with a ton of experience we had one lateral that came in from yamhill county sheriffs and he had 25 years of experience so i mean some of those can be higher on the pay scale some can be much lower some of our entry-level cops that we're trying to hire now will be much lower and they will go into these funds to try and keep costs down but eventually colas will continue to go up and they could outpace what the cpiu is we just don't know so that's why we try and keep a little bit of a reserve in here and same thing for the pension costs and the health care costs as well um and and then just in terms of staffing levels and and given that's been we haven't had the full number of sworn officers employed in the last three years this fund is to fund supposedly to fund three extra police officers but yet we've always been three officers down for the last three years and so and the city as you you know is is like super safe great safe city as 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 you you pointed out so i'm i'm actually just you know recommending that we take a look at the need for these three officers at all and and potentially you know could be lowering those those bills for for consumers or, or for, for residents you know rather than ensuring that they increase every year yeah like many of our staffing it's police are just one of the many that are very difficult to hire much like planners and hr manager <laughs> staff just hiring in general is very difficult we're hoping that the market will change but it's hard to know you know with staffing yeah <clears throat> of course the side effect of not having a full fte level in police and we work very hard to try to keep it full is that many times officers have to pull extra shifts this adds stress to themselves and their families which of course is something that none of us would want so it's, it's not quite as simple as because the hiring environment is very hard and very competitive and makes it hard to keep to full force. That doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't want to keep to full force because to have the most healthy and effective work-life balance that we can have for our officers who risk their lives for us every day, I would say that it would be very positive to try to get to full staff. So um, just to wrap this conversation up, uh, my understanding is that you were budgeting budgeting for the amount of uh, full-time employees that you think it's appropriate, whether, I mean, I think um, HR's uh, managers everywhere are looking for people in all sorts of roles. So our companies are, are looking for people in all sorts of roles. So um, you want to budget for this um, expense and if, say you are able to put place heads in these seats of this in this line, but there are empty seats, that money will stay in the general fund. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. 
Yeah. And I think it's also <clears throat> important to remember um, every officer uh, is at a different stage in their career. So if you don't backfill or, and it takes, if I hire a brand new officer, uh, I'm just depending on, you know, how well they take to the job. Um, if they are, if, if they prove to be uh, able to keep the officer, it takes 18 months to two years to really train someone. So if you stop hiring, you've got to make up that gap. It's, I mean, I hate to compare us to a lumber mill, but at some point, if you don't put lumber on the on the uh, conveyor, you have nothing there. So you always, not to mention, it is a very difficult market, uh, obviously by the raise that, that the, the market rate uh, that has gone up because of recent events it hasn't helped. Um, you always have to have that supply coming in. And so uh, it's not easy to uh, lure people away necessarily from, you know, uh, uh, lateral police officers, which of course that, you know, takes very, uh, very little time, but you're paying more upfront because they come with experience and, and you have to, you can't accept, expect them to take a lower pay cut to come in. Uh, that, that just doesn't work either. So um, we, we have been fortunate to hire, but then we've also had retirements. So we don't over hire. We tried to get to the number that I think, and that we need. I think my concern was more was truly more about um, if we don't hire a full force, where does that fund balance end up, and are we rolling that over from year to year? And so, which fund is it? Is it this this fund or the? the It'll go to the general fund. Yeah. Okay. Just to clarify and make sure that the question asked and answered was clear, so that we don't get citizen comment the fund that we were talking about does not go into the general fund if not used no. it is restricted use for only if they we hire here and don't hire in the general fund that money of course stays in the general fund just so that we're clear yes and that's that's our plan is to fill these positions because they're funded and then we can preserve the general fund revenue if we have vacant positions which can go into general contingency next year Please move forward, unless, okay. All right. That's if, all I have. No other questions, we'll move on to community development funds. All right, Doug Rucks, community development director. So we'll start with fund eight, which is our building fund. Uh, in our resources, you can see that we are down the total amount um, roughly about $302,000. And that's in part played with slowdown in the economy, in construction. Um, and this is kind of the year where we started to tap into some of our contingency. Um, so that's why you can see the difference there. In our uh, personnel services, as Katie had already mentioned at the last meeting, those increases are retirement and PERS and COLA. Uh, the one change that's in this budget is we are adding a 0.25 FTE to the building fund for admin services. So we're taking a person who's already in the department, that's a 0.75, we're going to elevate them to a one FTE, but 0.25 of that's going to go to the building fund to help with those processes. Um, materials and services, it's really... We, took a hard look and did a pretty much a status quo uh, for line items. We did have a few adjustments in our office supplies of about a thousand supplies and equipment, about 1900. And that's for new touchscreen monitors, chairs, rain gear for the staff that are out doing inspections in the rain, trying to keep them dry and healthy. Uh, travel and training increased slightly just because the cost of going to conferences and so forth goes up every year. Uh, maintenance agreements uh, going up. Uh, fuel, now that we have the new fuel, the time we put this together and so forth, and given the price of fuel and the volatility of it, that went up about 2000 Our biggest increase, so the overall expenditure increase went up just about a little over 60000 But Most of that came from the internal charge. So as Katie had mentioned, you know, the different funds paid back to Fund 31 to cover city manager, finance, IT, and all of that. And so... Um, 
that's where our biggest increase in our expenditure is in the building fund for next year. Questions? <laughs> hey, Doug. Real <laughs> Thank you. Um, plans examiner salary goes from 171000 to ninety two. Did they misbehave? What happened? No, they did not misbehave. Jared does a great job. <laughs> very dedicated. Very dedicated. No, in the current year budget, we budgeted for another plans examiner as a temporary position uh, over the course of the year. And as we monitored development activity and all the inspections and so forth, we chose not to pull the trigger and uh, recruit for that position. So we did not rebudget for it in 23-24. Good question. Thank you. We have no other questions. Yeah, just, just just one in terms of estimating those building permits, and I know that's a bit of tea, tea, re, tea leaf reading for you, trying to predict the future. Um, I'm, I'm just, you know, noticing how it's less than half of, of 2021, and I'm just wondering um, how, uh, uh, actually just wondering how close you've been on, on this. Uh, so you've, we've adopted uh, 36, uh, 360,000 for this year. Our, is that is that panning out like you expected? Um, I'm hoping so. Again, so we were putting together these projections. So what we do is I talk with all the developers about what they're anticipating they're going to do in any given fiscal year. And so we've already modeled that in the planning, but you've already seen that. We do a similar process on the building side, and we look at the type of construction that's going to occur. And then staff runs through the numbers on the rates that we charge and that's how we come up with the estimate so where we were at back in 21 22 the economy was still we were in COVID, but the economy was still doing good there were still a lot of single family homes being built and so forth but now as we're seeing it and i've mentioned before as we're seeing a downturn in the single family construction we have a couple of multi-family projects that we've modeled in so it has a different fee structure to those so I don't have all the exact numbers year over year compared to where we, we did, but typically we're pretty close. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, let's move on to Fund 14, Economic Development Fund. So this is a fund. Did you have a question on the last one? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I, I, it's, I didn't turn the page. What is the capital outlay of 80,000 for Doug? Two new pickups. So we had budgeted for those this year uh, with the supply chain problems and the long lead time, they were not gonna come in. So in our estimates, we took the money out and we rebudgeted with a $10,000 increase because cost of vehicles go up. So that's what the 80,000 is. We're trying to get on the schedule similar with public works so that we have our, uh, our fleet for building division for five years, and then we roll it over. So we're main, making sure that we're getting the highest value when we sell those used vehicles. And so we've coordinated that with Public Works. Thank you. Any more questions? Moving along. Okay, fun 14. This is the fun one. There's three different elements to it. So bear with me. <laughs> Katie and I laugh about this one all the time. Um, so you'll see all of the beginning fund balances for these three different funds that are within this overall fund. And so those numbers vary each, each budget cycle. In the economic development, you can see that we have nothing proposed for 23-24. So the economic health manager position was eliminated in the current fiscal year. It's not budgeted to be replaced. And so that's why you see zeros. And so that has a big ripple effect throughout the uh, entire economic development budget. Um, you'll also see there's um, reductions in our um, materials and services. And again, is when that position uh, was funded with an individual, we had a kind of our standard trainings, conferences, and so forth that I was going to. Then we had the, the economic health position. By removing that, then all of those expenses that were attributed to that individual went away from the 23-24 budget. Then we have the affordable housing portion. Um, so this one, 
uh, is identified to um, for uh, materials and services, it's status quo. Nothing, nothing changes. For the construction excise tax, um, again, we had uh, a program. So the council has uh, moved the sunset date up on the construction excise tax. So that will terminate on July 1st. So we did not put any staffing in for the construction excise tax. So 4% of the revenue that was collected was attributed to our housing planner. So we budgeted in this year, but we did not budget it for 23-24. And the council will have to make a determination what we do with the funds that we have collected, which I'll get to. Uh, correspondingly, in materials and services under the construction excise tax, by not having any staff, we don't have any material and service costs proposed for 23-24. Then we get into the special payments. And uh, so under 14913060001, uh, miscellaneous grants. And so that $10,000 is for the Newburgh Downtown Coalition. So they received $10,000 in this fiscal year, which will come out in the supplemental budget before the end yep. of the year. <laughs> and then 10,000 and the council had approved that particular expenditure. Our EDRLF uh, fund for expenditure, uh, the big reduction there is due to uh, the council approved uh, basically a loan for the Fairfield Inn. And so it comes out of that line item uh, and that will be expended by the end of this fiscal year. I keep working with the developer to get that done. The housing authority loans, uh, the trust fund grants, those are out of the trust fund itself. And so the reductions are attributed to uh, expenditure of funds for this fiscal year. Council has not seen that yet. That's coming up at their meeting on the 20th, but we budgeted assuming that we were going to expend the funds based upon uh, our notice of funding availability and the applications that we received. The one that says YC Housing Authority grants, that is our CDBG grant, Community Development Block Grant. And so that has to be completed by December 20th of this year. And so part of the expenditure will occur in 23, 24. Then we've got to submit all the paperwork to Business Oregon and close that grant out. Um, and then we have the three categories for the CET you can see listed there. And so that was our anticipated at the time we put the budget together of what uh, we would have for fiscal year 23-24. I can say until council makes a determination of what they're going to do with those funds. And Katie and I chatted uh, yesterday about this, is that this fund may have to come back for a supplemental sometime in 23-24 in order to realign everything. Spoke yeah. with the city manager about that as well. Um, so that's pretty much fund 14. Yes. Where does the uh, funds come for the first two items, the uh, capital e uh, economic development and the affordable housing funds? Can you give me account number? 3000 and 30001. First two items on fund 14. Oh, oh the fund balance. Yeah, where does that, where did that cash come from? Uh, okay, so the for the first two, the economic development fund, uh, that came from a community development block grant that housing, that the housing and urban development let the city keep. It was for, um, remember Allen Fruit? Okay, it goes all the way back to Allen Fruit uh, when we got some federal money. And so we did a, a loan program to businesses and then uh, the Federal government allowed us to keep the money that was not expended. So that was the seed money. Also, each year, a business license that are paid goes into the Economic Development Fund for economic development purposes. The Affordable Housing Trust Fund, uh, out of that original Economic Development Fund money, $75,000 was taken out as the seed money for the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. And that was done by council, by ordinances and resolutions at that time. So every year we budget and what we don't expend becomes the beginning fund balance in both the economic development and the affordable housing. Thank you. 
can understand. Okay. Just looking at the materials and services, since you don't have a position there, why why would you have budgeted anything for materials and services? Kind of like under affordable housing? No, under uh, the economic. Which are we still have economic development activities. What we don't have is a position. Okay. And so at this point in time is the community development director is doing the economic development activities. And so we still have expenses uh, for that. And so the, like our bank fees, people pay their business license by credit card. As an example, we have maintenance agreements for our track it's permitting system because our business licenses are in that. And so we have an annual maintenance fee. Uh, there are documents from time to time that we have to record related to an economic development activity. So we budget some money to do those recordings. Um, dues and meetings is another one and travel and training. There are still conferences and so forth to go to on economic development. The ones that we typically go to is the Oregon Economic Development Association, and they put on two conferences a year. So those are some of the examples. Just real quick, we um, sunsetted the CET, but we still have them the, to figure out what to do with it. But we have no one who's going to work on that, or is that, again, going to devolve to you and Clay? And that will land with the community development director and yeah. staff. <laughs> the, um, can you explain the loan fees under affordable housing? And I see it's uh, a source of revenue up above, and now it's at... Um, it's under materials and services. So expenditures, yeah. So um, if we do loans, which we can do both out of the Economic Development Fund and the Affordable Housing Fund, then we contract with the Mid-Willamette Valley Council of Governments to do the underwriting and prepare the loan documents for that. So we charge the applicant, if it's a loan, the cost of that. So that's the revenue that comes in. And then the expenditure, both economic development and affordable housing are the expenses in order to do that underwriting. So it's, it's just, just a pass through. Yes, we pay for services. And by we, I mean, the loan applicant does through us. Right. So if we had a, had a loan, the applicant would have to pay an application fee, then we send it to the Council of Governments, they do the underwriting, send the paperwork back to us, but then we have to pay the Council of Governments for that service. We do not have that technical expertise on staff <laughs> at this time, specialized field. <laughs> okay, if no further questions, we can move along to emergency management planning. Welcome to the hot seat. <laughs> uh, Russ Thomas, Public Works Director for the City of Newburgh. Uh, thanks for meeting tonight. Um, we've got several funds that we cover in public works from street, water, sewer, storm, uh, capital outlay, uh, capital improvements. Uh, and what I've done is assembled a management team for public works is here. So if we have questions, we might be referring back to the experts on their individual areas uh, to deal with that. Uh, in one of the key things that happened in this past year is our emergency management planning. Uh, part of what we discovered during COVID was the shortcomings of what we had in, assembled for emergency management planning, and also discovered some of the things that we needed to be doing that hadn't been done. And so we've rolled that into all of the funds to cover that because if we have a major emergency, public works is gonna be in the heart of it. Uh, whether it's dealing with drinking water, uh, facilities for, for sewage, uh, transportation, our stormwater. Uh, so we cover all of that. So each one of the funds cover a portion of our emergency management planning training uh, and we deal with a variety of things. And I think you've seen the, the outline in that. So that's covered in, in all of our funds. Um, starting with our street fund, uh, if anybody's driven our local streets, you know that uh, we have, have issues. Uh, one of the things that we're facing across all funds and everybody's facing at home is the increase in costs, material uh, costs. 
uh, our labor has stayed static for the last few years, but costs have continued to increase. And in some cases, we realized 100% increase in some of the costs of materials uh, due to supply chain shortages. Uh, some materials come from foreign countries, uh, and so it had to be resourced. So there's there's been significant increases in that. In our street fund, uh, what we're proposing this year is the addition of a three-man concrete crew to handle our own concrete work, sidewalk repairs, sidewalk improvements. And in doing that, what we've done is reduced our revenues or our expenditures in capital programs that we're doing. We reduced our expenditures that we've done for contracting out that sidewalk work, and especially in light of the ADA requirements that we're facing uh, continually. So with this, our, our program is designed to be uh, net zero uh, cost in our reduction in costs and our savings. The additional thing that it will do is provide benefit to those residents, homeowners, to improve the sidewalks at a reduced cost overall. They're responsible for their costs, but we are responsible for the public right away, the street corners, the ADA ramps. And where it ties in, we have an opportunity, a community of doing a uh, scale savings for the homeowners because we can only recover what our expenses are uh, to make those improvements throughout town. There's many gaps, there's many failing sidewalks uh, that need to be done, and this is an opportunity for us to bring those facilities up to standards or at least passability to provide a safe passage for our pedestrians. And one of the things that we've discovered during COVID, people walk more. Uh, they walk a lot. And we have areas that people are walking in the street because of the sidewalk conditions or the lack of sidewalk. So that's that's one of our major additions into our, our, our fund too that we have. Um, resources uh, have stayed about static uh, on what we've done uh, in the past. Uh, we've got miscellaneous uh, things that we, we bring it in from. Our transportation utility fee is one of our major uh, sources that help fund the improvements in the street fund. And that money goes right back out into our uh, programs that we are doing to upgrade the streets, the failing streets. One of the things we take a look at is where we can get the most bang for the buck. Uh, there's some streets that can't be saved or rehabilitated without major reconstruction. And is that where we want to put our money or do we want to put it into streets that have good subgrades that we can rebuild and save and extend the amount of work? Can we do two blocks or 10 blocks uh, to do that? And so we, we have to evaluate that and we do that along with our engineering uh, with that. The uh, gas taxes, as everybody's aware, gas taxes, uh, while we got more vehicles on the road, we're getting less revenue share. Uh, the electrification of transportation throughout the state is affecting that. I know the state legislature is working on additional revenue sources for the future. But uh, as we continue to ex expand, get more streets uh, and more traffic on them, we're seeing a static amount of money with increases of up to 25% in materials, asphalt costs, concrete costs uh, that affect everything across the board. So our, our revenues have stayed pretty much static over, over this past year for the street fund. And I was going to mention too the we keep the the regular street fund separate from the the TUF, the transportation utility fee, which is what we collect on the municipal statement, uh, because those have specific uses for it. So I believe it's for maintenance for maintenance of roads. We use we utilize the gas tax revenues for maintenance activities. And the tough strictly for the reconstruction, reconstruction. and repavement of streets. Yeah. So that's why we keep those funds designated separately out on here. Questions. So what is bikeway taxes? Is there a tax on bicycles? Yes, it's part of the, the gas tax revenue. Yeah. I, yeah. I didn't know that. I mean <laughs> what one of the things you notice when we reconstruct a street, it has bike lanes on it. We're required by state law to put the bike lanes in there. And as part of that, the gas tax funding, they help fund part of that cost. So I am going to ask. So I look here at the adopted at, uh, 
a million nine hundred for the gas tax, and we're talking about how it's going down. But then again, we're proposing two million and thirty-five. Can you explain to me a little bit why? Yeah. So historically, it's been declining, but then they said last year because these are all a year behind on everything. After everything kind of opened back up from COVID and gas prices were really low, they saw a record high of people traveling around by car instead of flying somewhere or staying at home. So they said that it went up slightly, but they're not expecting it to stay that way. That it was kind of a one-time thing based off of everybody finally taking that trip after the, the COVID lockdown. I did quite a bit of academic research on this and actually wrote a paper about this particular problem. So we can expect to see revenue from this source being basically flat going forward. We do know that there will be state revenues coming from the new source, but we expect to not start to see that until 2026. So it's a, it's a unique and what we would call a wicked problem between the cost of road repair and maintenance and flat. Between the uh, transportation utility fee and the gas tax, we're bringing in about 3.3 .3 million this year. But we're not spending anywhere. We're spending less than a million dollars on road maintenance. So where's the rest of it? Or why am I not seeing a bigger figure there? You're seeing two different pools of money, as we mentioned earlier. The gas tax money supports the maintenance activities, which in the in the street fund which is also engineering maintenance activities all that the tough supports the programs where we're rebuilding the streets uh repaving uh, and all that so it's it's basically you're, you're lumping both pools together when we keep them separate so where does it show up is it under those um special projects further back or it, it will show up in in fund 18 and in our uh capital project yeah Yeah, because um, let me see here. Yeah, you'll see that there's transfers out, and that's where you'll they're going to fund 18 for projects related to the street improvements. And of course, for any given year, if you actually look at that year's planned capital improvement program list, that's where the money, that's where the rubber really meets the road. So just to be clear, Russ, um, tough is for reconstruction of streets and the gas tax is for taxes for maintenance. What does maintenance look like? Fixing the ADA right corner. Uh, maintenance is anything to do with our transportation system from street signs to painting the roadway to putting down that dust abatement on our gravel streets to patching potholes to uh, repairing failed small sections of street uh, to street lighting. Okay, that's super helpful. One more question. You, uh, the maintenance salaries, I'm on page 77, are three and a half times what they were last year. I'm assuming that's because of the three new sidewalk. That's correct. Staff. Okay, thank you. Okay, move along. Um, we've got three areas in the street maintenance uh, or in the street fund. One is street engineering. That's basically a static uh, number. We've increased the entire budget uh, approximately $2,500 uh, <laughs> across that and, and trying to hold that. One of the biggest increases that we do have, again, and been mentioned earlier, is the internal charges for administrative services. Uh, street maintenance, again, uh, we've talked about the three new positions. One of the things that you will notice in there, some numbers have gone way up and some have disappeared. And what we've done in, in taking a look at past practices and what we've done, some of, the, some of those are actually duplicate and we're using those funds line items for the exact same thing. So what we've done is squished them together to make budgeting easier uh, for us, for finance, for tracking. Uh, purposes in that respect. 
one of the, and again, the biggest thing that has impacted us is the inflationary costs that have gone up dramatically. Uh, where we used to buy a ton of asphalt for $60, it's now costing us 140. And if you think about a ton of asphalt, that doesn't go far. Um, so those are, those are some of the cost increases. Concrete's increased. Uh, all of the materials that we use has increased in cost. Uh, one thing of note, street lighting, we have switched the, almost all of our street lights to LEDs. Uh, and with the projected increase in electric costs by PGE, we're staying flat. So the savings we realized in switching to LEDs were staying ahead of the curve, so to speak, on the increases in electric charges. Just a quick um, request. I think we made this last budget year and we didn't ever get around to it, but at some point, could we, ha and not during this budget cycle, have a, a work session or an understanding of how you do the allocation of, do I fix this crumbling street or do I keep another street from crumbling? Just educate us, not not arguing with what you're doing, just trying to. We can, we can do that. There, It's actually a grading system that, that we utilize and we can do a presentation on how, how we do it. Is it a one or is it a hundred? Okay, no further questions. Okay, fund six. Uh, we're jumping 18. Yeah, we're doing that one next meeting. Ah, okay. <laughs> we can do that. Uh, wastewater fund, this is responsible for the operation of our wastewater treatment plant, our collection system, our lift stations uh, that we deal with to provide, uh, treat the water and uh, provide sanitary services for the community. The majority of the revenues here are uh, user fees that uh, we bring in uh, for the sales of this and some of the reimbursed costs that we that we realized. Uh, one of the things that we have discontinued, uh, compost sales. We used to bag compost and make compost available for sale in bags. What we discovered is the cost of the bag and bagging it was more than we were recovering. So we were basically not only giving it away, we were paying people to take it. Um, so we have discontinued the bagging of compost. We still have it uh, available for people to come and purchase, but uh, we're no longer. And that again is price increases that we realize through the cost of bagging and, and, and dealing with that. And the user fees on here are set from rate review process. Just a quick question. Um, Help me understand the 8 million to 14 million top line, page 83. Oh, for the beginning fund balance? Yep. Just carryover of capital projects. Didn't get done. Order. Yeah, there were several projects that we've either postponed or we've, yeah. And oftentimes our capital projects are such that they carry through multiple years. Exactly, yeah. And maybe someday we'll have a multi-year budget. Yes. We, we do think about the multi-year budget, but every time we think about it, our hearts break about how complicated it would be to shift to that model. There'll be a new software for that. I That's heard. right. I, I do have a question about the composting program that's going on. Do we have FTE dedicated to maintaining that program? For the compost? Yes. They're, they're part of the operators at our wastewater treatment plant. Thank you. So my question was, is... $15,000, is that all we get for sales of compost? That's about right. Um, you know, we, we try to stay competitive, yet one of, the, one of the benefits of that is we're getting rid of it. Uh, if you want to stop and think about it, uh, it's a way for us not to have a significant expenditures for getting rid of our what people refer to as sludge or the byproduct of the wastewater treatment process. Prior to composting, it would cost the city in the neighborhood of three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars a year to dispose of the sludge. We're recovering. We're getting fifteen thousand dollars a year and still accomplishing the same thing. And has there been any consideration on expanding the operating hours for that program? Because right now it's midweek, I believe, nine to three thirty. 
we we have talked about that so that we have it available. We we've, we've done a couple of weekends to make it available, especially when we get into uh, this time of year, to have have that available. Thank you. I work in regenerative agriculture, so I understand the challenges of getting rid of compost. Uh, yeah, uh, this topic is interesting to me. Do I, I didn't know about it until I was on council. Are we are we competitively priced? Are we way low? Um, do people need to know? Do we want more people to know so you can get rid of more of it? and serve our it, residents? We actually run out of it, but we are fairly competitive priced, but given the nature of the material we're producing, it is a class A bios, biosolids, which means it can be used anywhere. But when people stop and think where it came from, uh, sometimes they're not so amenable to uh, picking it up. It's a fun topic. Talk about uh, yeah. <laughs> moving forward. Oh, do you have a question? Yeah. So, are we the only city around the area that that does this program? We're the only one that has the type of composting that we do. Uh, there's several others that do various different things, and throughout the country, if anybody's used millorganite, uh, it's a garden additive that comes from Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And it's exactly what we have, only they're lime slating it and putting it in little pellets. So given the recent capital outlay on the wood dryer that I assume is tied to this program would be, and as a consumer of compost, I think it would be great to see more access to this if possible. We will we will take that and, and uh, work with it. Just so to understand, so we are no longer using resources to bag it and to kind of prep it we're we're but we're still open to people who want to come in and take that it. that's correct we we actually did not have the equipment the the equipment expenditures for us to bag it ourselves would be a couple of hundred thousand dollars to do that so we were actually hauling it to another facility that would bag it for us and hauling bags back um, and so their cost went up to the point where we can no longer do it it would it would pay them to bag that. And so now if someone wants to go and buy this stuff or this compost, they they have a place that they would have to come in and just put it in their truck. We are open to do that. And one of the things we're looking at doing in, in, in this next year is provide a, a source where people can come in with a gunny sack, so to speak, a small bag and, and get some and take it. Thank you. If no more questions. But one, oh, but, one more. But we're still, um, we still have a tractor there in a bucket to fill up pickups or somebody, landscaper comes in with a large truck. Yes, we do. Okay, good. Okay, <laughs> moving I'm forward. Just, I'm from Oh, one more really, question. Sorry, just, um, I am wondering if there's an advertising or some kind of marketing that goes for this. I do know I had a, a meeting with your person that does the recycling for the community and she was telling me that 2025 you're making all these changes and that um actually having putting food in the disposal is good for the system i mean is there like an education piece of the work that you guys do we do and we have it on our city website it's it's in our uh public works in our operations section that we have on there that has information on things like that we also did some really amusing videos where the dad goes to pour stuff down the sink and the mom's like, no, don't pour that down there. So we, we did a whole campaign on. Yeah, it was on Facebook. They, we have several on, on the city website. Okay, moving forward uh, then, now maybe this time from this topic. <laughs> All right. Um, wastewater engineering again uh, is pretty static, and, and again, the the largest is the internal charges that we deal with, um, and staying with that. And again, there's been some lines that appear and disappear because of that. The the shift and utilization of two things that mean say separ separately but mean the same thing. 
Uh, moving on to wastewater operations. Um, again, this is our biggest expense. This is operating the, the wastewater treatment plant and our sewage lift stations. Uh, not everything can get to the treatment plant without being pumped. And in, in fact, very little can because of, of the topography that we are in. So we have significant electrical charges, but our uh, solar uh, farm that we have out there is helping offset a portion of our electrical expense. Uh, that we're utilizing out there, and we and we're uh, continuing to to work towards that. One of the uh, largest expense uh, that we've had to deal with is again materials. Uh, we used to buy dried sawdust. We now, with the dryer, make our own dry sawdust to uh, facilitate the composting that that we deal with. Um, and then pump station, uh, we've got several lift stations or pump stations around town that. Uh, areas flow into that we pump it into the gravity system to get it down there and we are increasing maintenance on those and then equipment repair and maintenance is another issue we do have an aging plant uh, we are accelerating our maintenance activities uh, what we experienced in the past is we ran them a little too far and, and had to fix them after they broke uh, which can cause issues and now we're taking a look at accelerating that to address them uh, kind of the just in time, uh, just before they break on that. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is in the capital outlay, there's a big number down there. That's our savings account. We used to budget for every little thing from uh, replacing chains, replacing blowers, replacing a whole bunch of things. And we're not doing that. We're going to run them and utilize them as to the extent of their life and then utilize this as a savings account as needed when we need to replace those items. And we've done the same thing in our, in our water treatment plant. Questions? I don't see a revenue fee for the electric, uh, the solar pro, uh, panel. Is that going to be on the next budget or is you include that in something else? The, the fee? Oh, the revenue from it? Uh, basically, it goes back to the plant, and it's kind of an exchange program. I think that it's just a net. So it's a it's a net net reduction, right? Yes. Net reduction in electrical yes. cost. So we don't get we don't get money. We do have the ability to track what our reductions are. Oh, just one more question. I see uh, on the wastewater operations that there has been uh, you had a decrease in personnel. Because I see what we adopted for last year is more from from this year. So we we have added one more operator okay. uh, that we've have down there simply because of the complexity of what we're doing and trying to keep up on it again. When compost lift stations, uh, they work with with a wide variety of things, and we've needed to to do that, and we've done that in, in the past, and also we have through our yeah, Dan. It's, Dan is just because I see a low, like a lower number. So we, that's we, we've had a we've had a loss of higher paid employees. Got it. And an increase in lower paid employees. Okay, that that <laughs> so that's Thank you. due to retirement. We we right. We like to see people retire, but they the new people have to get trained, but they make less. Money. It right, take it, it takes time. <laughs> thank you, Dan. Uh, Dan, that was Dan Wilson. Our uh water treatment plant superintendent who also doubles as the backup for our wastewater treatment plant superintendent, Craig Pack, who is on vacation. So we're, so the budget's now 531,000 instead of 548,000 and we have one additional person. Wow. Well, we reduced a higher, as he said, right. we reduced right. one higher and got two. Yeah. Yeah. Other questions on fund six? Yeah. Um, could you uh, uh, describe what goes into our safety program? I, I see that uh, the 21, 22 budget uh, looks like we didn't have much of one and then looks like we got a safety program this year. Um, and uh, 
just wondering what, what the description is on that. We're looking at 40K. Which line item, it's Greg? Uh, hmm? yeah. Safety program, uh, yeah, 524000. Oh, okay. Uh, let me find it here. One of the things that we are have been working on is number one, we have to get into the sawdust silo. Uh, we don't have railings on the roofs of our buildings, uh, which means that everybody has to put a harness on, get tied off, get tied back to the building before they can go up on the roof. A lot of times we have to go up there to check temperatures in our composter. Uh, there's missing railings on there that are required by OSHA. And so part of the safety program is going to be installing these required railings that are up there to provide a, a safe environment for our employees to work in. Okay, so a one-time. It's a, it's, it's a major one-time expense. Got it. And, and then I had an, an additional question just regarding the capital outlay. You, you mentioned that that's kind of now your, your, your savings account for replacing tools and chains and, and, and whatnot. Um, $600,000, normal $600,000, a lot of chains and, and, and whatnot. The, the intent is not to spend any of it. We don't have to. And the intent is not to spend all of it. Uh, it just makes it readily available for us to access should we have it. One of the things that we had happen was a couple of the rotors. If you've been down to the treatment plant, you see those things in there. Broken half and fell into the oxidation ditches unexpectedly. Um, fortunately, due to the the uh, craftiness of our operators, they rebuilt them themselves rather than having somebody else do it at a significant savings. But it's these unexpected items that happen. We have four large pumps in our influent lift station that 100% of our sewage is pumped into the treatment plant. Should we lose one of those pumps, they're several hundred thousand dollars a piece uh, on that. So it's, it's a hedge, rainy day hedge fund for that. Hope we never have to use it, but it's there. So, yeah. So, so this is your saving up because you don't have to say they might at some point they will fail. At some point we will need to replace them, and this is setting it setting it aside so that we can build up those funds to be able to do that when that happens. And since we hadn't built it up before, we're now starting we're up. we're starting to put together savings to and do that. I, and if I were to look at, for example, line item. Uh, Zero six five one three one five six six zero zero zero. That we have two hundred sixty three thousand. Those are the maintenance that you had. That you really expect that those are like recurring maintenance. That that's that recurring have. maintenance that we have to do to keep the plant functioning and meeting the uh, discharge requirements that's placed on us by both the state and the federal government. And for what you said in the past, you would have a line item or bucket here also. This, this number would have been much changes. bigger, right? And and we'd also have another line item for other items that okay. need to be done. Thank you. If no more questions on this, moving forward, we hop back and forth. I know we're on maintenance now, right? We're on maintenance. Um, again. Uh, actual reduction in our material supplies because we've combined some things and, and done things a little a little differently. And, and thanks to uh, our staff who helped put this together, refined our numbers, sharpen the pencil. Uh, some of the items that we were doing in the past, we realized that was an expense that was a placeholder. Well, let's not hold the place anymore. Let's actually use the funds where they need to be used uh, for that. So there has been uh, a reduction in that. We are also looking at, uh, you know, again, there's an increase in uh, personnel costs. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, retirements. We've got a lot of new folks uh, that are coming on board, and that's uh, precipitated an increase in training costs as well uh, to bring them on board to do that. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we're doing to try and save, we're doing more activities across the board, not only for public works, but for the city, is we've uh, built our own fuel station. And we're now purchasing fuel, uh, although the price of fuel, who knows what it's going to do tomorrow. Uh, 
uh, we have to plan for the worst where it's been. Uh, and so that's why you see some of these expenses, but we hope to have a more accurate number after it's been online and operational to, to do that. We're purchasing bulk fuel through state contract now versus uh, doing it through a state contract on card lock systems, which does increase the cost. Yes. I got to ask about the $11 million contingency fund. One of, one of the things that we are going to be facing in the not too distant future with the expansion of the city, the building is our treatment plant. While uh, the majority of the plant can handle the capacity of it. One of the things that we do experience during winter weather is surges, our oxidation ditches uh, and our EQ basin or equalization basin can handle the majority of the surges. But several times now we, we what we call topping out it's actually overflowing out of it. We washed solids that ultimately end up in our compost sludge that we remove. We've actually washed some of those uh, through the system. And so one of the things that we are going to be faced with in the not too distant future is uh, turning our equalization basin into a third oxidation ditch and the possibility of building an, an additional equalization basin to handle those surges that we deal with in the winter time. We've reduced our I and I into the system significantly, but recent construction, addition of homes, and expansion is is putting us at a point where, while we can treat it on a normal basis, it's those the wet weather events that add to it that we are going to have to plan for expansion in the future. We're still a ways away, but we again are setting money aside for that future eventuality. So this would be a good chance for me to learn. I assume that that's on the capital improvements list for down the road. Well, how do these things come together? That I mean, we it lives in a contingency fund, and they in the and we set the money aside in the contingency fund. But most of these are planned through our uh, wastewater master plan. Taking a look at it, obviously these plans are are put together five years ago, six years ago, seven years ago. We couldn't foresee. The additional development that's happened, the construction that pops up within a year or two, uh, we can plan for it, but not knowing are is it going to be a hundred single-family homes on a large lot? Is it going to be three hundred and fifty single-family homes on the same size of property, which then uh, increases the flows into our system? So we have okay. to kind of constantly be moving the target, uh, and again, we'll be taking a look at updating our wastewater master plan. We've just updated the water. We'll be looking down the road to update our wastewater master plan to address those changes that have happened since it was updated the last time. The This this project here is, is in our water ma wastewater master plan for the future, not this year. So to, kind of to put it another way, we're, we're thinking there will come a time when new oxidation ditches will be needed and they're on the 20 year uh, CIP list, right. they're out there. But <laughs> if we found ourselves in a bind and we had no choice, we had to get into it and build another oxidation ditch, which we wouldn't want to do yet, we have contingency funds to start to think about that. Now, we don't think our population growth is going to get us there until, and I can't remember the year that the oxidation ditches are on there, but it's a ways out. But if it happens sooner than we thought it would, if if yet more apartment complexes get built and there's more and more coming in, we're just hedging our bets a little bit. The the other intent is for us to be have not be in a loan position. We want to have cash on hand yeah. to be able to address these needs rather than having to incur more debt. Yeah, that's the that's the main one, especially because we're doing another water treatment plan and taking out loan for that. We don't want to be in a position where we've got another loan we have to take out because that could affect some of our debt to equity ratio. OK, so if there are no further questions on this, I am going to suggest a 10 minute break and we'll come back here at 720 on the dot. OK. Sounds great. Stickler, or oh, I'm so glad you know.
So let's keep going. Uh, keep continue where we picked up at Fun Seven Water. Uh, thank you, um, Water. Uh, obviously, one thing we don't produce over there is compost. Uh, thankfully. <laughs> Um, but again, as everybody's acutely aware, we are in the process of getting ready to construct a new groundwater treatment plant. Our existing plant is over 70 years old. It's had numerous upgrades to it. However, it's not got increased capacity. It does not have seismic resiliency. And uh, there's additional uh, criteria that was placed on us by the state health department to cover those. So the expense of doing that would have given us a 70 plus year old plant in the current uh, capacity to produce water that we currently have with no reduction in any of the operating expenses or, or any of that. So that's one of the major things that we've got going on and, and kind of our focus for the next three to four years is, is building a new, constructing a new groundwater treatment plant to provide adequate water uh, for the city and ensure that we have uh, a functioning viable plant for the next 50 plus years. Um, and so that's that's where a lot of our savings and money we're putting away uh, in the water fund is headed towards. Uh, we're gonna try and fund this self fund as much as we possibly can with that. We've reduced some of our uh, capital improvement programs uh, to do that and with the eye on on trying to fund it as best we can. Fortunately, we were accepted for a, a federal loan program, low interest loan program. And, and the caveat with that is we don't have to start paying it back until it's substantially completed. We've had discussions on how long can we not complete the water treatment plant. <laughs> um, but uh, anyway, so we're, we're, we're working towards that. So that's in our in our revenue. You'll, you'll see the beginning working capital, again, savings towards that we, that we continue in trying to work on. And then our uh, user fees is our biggest revenue uh, points in that. I'm also right now in the process of writing a grant application for $821,000 for BIL, bipartisan infrastructure law money. So it's my hope that we'll get some more grants along the way to help keep the cost down. And this particular part is, very recently, the federal government has allowed the Department of Energy to start to do some grant giving. Traditionally, they were a technical branch of the government, not a, not a financial branch. And if we're able to get that, it will be part of the cost for the solar part of the next plant. It will therefore reduce the cost somewhat. Well, I hope we get it. I'll be looking for political support. Okay, so I'm going to jump into, since you were talking about contingency and planning for this, et cetera. So I see that we start the year with a $14 uh, million. And then when I look at the reserves for the contingency, we are at 10,332. Now I'm thinking that maybe some of that money is a transfer out to other capital projects. Can you talk a little bit about this because I guess it'd be good to understand why we have that gap. Uh, for that, I'm going to ask Karen to uh, come up. Karen Hoffman is our city engineer, and she's the one that works very closely with this. So uh, there, there's a couple of different things. The transfer out for capital projects or for projects that are going to be in next fiscal year. Um, but the treatment plan itself is going to be built over the next several years. So there will be, there's still some in contingency that will get used, you know, in 24, 25, in, in those out, further out years um, to, can, to finish building the, the plant along with the loans that we get. So did that answer the question? It does. It just, I just wanted to make sure that because, you know, you know to the, the Nate kid eyes to it. Started with 14, now we only have 10. So right. that four will be used for some of these capital projects in preparation that is not covered by the, this loan. Is that correct? Right. So the, the loan itself, the WIFI loan will cover 49% of a package of projects. Um, so it's not for the entire 
treatment plan itself. So there's still money that we have to um, expand in a variety of ways. The grant can help offset it, but um, there are other pieces that have to be used. So I think it's good uh, to you know to know that this loan is not going to cover the entire thing. It's going to cover part of it, and we still need to do our due diligence and making sure that we have the other monies stored in contingency for as the years that is going to take for us to. Uh, complete this. Thank you. Correct. And I think it's um, important to note too, of that 4.7 million that's being transferred out to the capital projects fund, 1.5 million of that is for the groundwater treatment plant next year. 1.5. Another thing to highlight here is that we're fortunate and that we knew this day was coming. And so that's why we were able to build up reserves in this area. As we go through the process of building the water plant, you're going to see this amount substantially reduced. Yeah, this was all a part of the rate review process where they look at the capital project list and determine what's futuristic and try and save money each year towards cash funding big projects or partial cash funding big projects in this case. So just to, just to be clear then, the money that we have for doing capital projects, um, some comes from the rates that we receive and we allocate some of that into savings. And some comes from STCs, which we accrue as people build things. And then a big chunk is coming from past savings that we've done. And then the WIFI alone. Is there anything else um, other than any grants that we get? That's kind of the... Mostly grants, yes. We did receive $500,000 from the previous uh, by, uh, bipartisan infrastructure um, law. So that is is helping build a part of that those programs. Okay. It's and also, then ARPA. We got and ARPA. And ARPA. ARPA. Okay, thanks. Yep. Okay, so if no more questions, moving on. All right. Uh, in the water, the water engineering uh, portion of that, again, our largest expense is the internal uh, charges for support. One of the things you'll notice, and it's, and it's throughout the engineering budgets and the capital outlay, uh, we have to replace our GIS server, our mapping server that we use, all the city uses, but it's a primary function uh, for uh, public works in dealing with uh, maintaining all of our mapping. And, and systems, water, sewer, storm, streets that we utilize. And it's utilized by all the other departments. We have reached capacity and it's not a small item. So it's, it's spread evenly amongst all of the funds. And again, we've got some lines that have appeared bigger and others that have disappeared because again, we're, we're working on squashing some of these multiple accounts that mean the same thing. Uh, moving on to operations. Thank you, Karen. Um, in, op in operations, one of the, the biggest uh, factors that we've faced is the increase in cost of materials. One of the biggest costs, not only is the increase we're facing uh, from PGE, but for the uh, material that we use to make our uh, disinfectant for our water, uh, the hypochlorite that we had. Uh, actually, during one period of time, the cost 300%, Dan, something like that. It went up, the tanker oh, loads, hydroxide. the hydroxide yes. went up went up 300%. And we use it for pH adjustment. But that was one of the things we went from $4,000 a tanker load to 16, it's close to, considered. yeah. And it's And it's gone back down, but we don't know. What's going to happen with that? Uh, but that's one of our, our biggest expenses. Again, you'll notice a big number in capital outlay. That's our savings account. Should something happen, our intent is not to spend any of this money. But we, over the next four years during the construction, we do have to keep our water treatment plant operating. We're going to run them right into the ground. Uh, so to speak, uh, as long as it will run, our intent is not to expend any unnecessary funds on the maintenance and upkeep of this treatment plant, as long as we can meet the treat the water requirements uh, to save those funds for the construction of our new treatment plant. Uh, 
normally we'd be doing spending money on on significant maintenance activities but we're going to again it's the rainy day fund should we have a major pump failure uh something at one of our wells issues that would affect the our ability to produce the water and, and provide it to the community I just realized you're going to run it into the groundwater, which I think would be a contamination <laughs> yeah. issue, so you shouldn't do that. But seriously, what are you going to do with the old plant? How are you going to what, once the once the new plant is constructed, up and running and operational, we're going to remove it. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, seismic event could do it for us. <laughs> <laughs> you are cheerful tonight. No, knock on wood. uh into the into the maintenance the uh, oh, water just maintenance a moment. Uh, again uh, we've got a I oh, think there's a comment go ahead. here i apologize sorry mate um i was just going to say somebody asked me if we could also add a bit of reporting to next year's budget cycle showing how well we did on not spending these funds and also on showing any elements where we did do some capital rollover and so we're we're going to do that we're going to look at that and figure out how to represent that in some manner or transparency. A graph. Sure. Okay, water, water maintenance. Um, one of the, uh, again, you'll see lines disappear and lines increase. One of the things that we're facing is we have almost completed our upgrade of our water meter uh, program changing to the fixed base radio read. Uh, over the years, we've gone from uh, pencil and paper uh, to pencil and paper on a bicycle to uh, touch read with a handheld unit where we could read them. You know, instead of a book of 400 pages, uh, down to a handheld uh, computer. To now, we are almost at the at the cusp of completing the uh, change over to where all the water meters can be read by radio from the office and, and reducing the time in that. The additional thing that this will add is the ability for our residents to have an app on their phone and they can will be able to see at any time what their water bill is, what their water consumption is, and can actually be able to set an alarm on there if your meter doesn't quit running. It will tell you you have a leak. Um, so this is a this is a program we've been self-performing and have been working on for the past four years. We're very close to completing it. Hopefully by this fall, uh, we'll be at that stage. Uh, we've done all the hard work. We've got the antennas up, the software's in. It, it um, merges with our financial software. Uh, so the basic thing now is just the final push to replace the meters. We had them budgeted in a, in a capital program before. We're now putting it in here because we know we're seeing the end. The second thing is we started so long ago that we're now in the, the mode of having to replace meters that are 20 years old because we started in this upgrade 20 years ago uh, to the touch read and gone to radio read. And now we're there uh, to the to the fixed space. So we're going to have to see that. And the second component is growth. Uh, as we grow, each one of the new uh, buildings that we get has to have a new meter. Costs have gone up, and so we're we're faced again with that conundrum of increased uh, expenses for materials and supplies, increased growth, and how do we manage that? Uh, this is our our cash register, so to speak, and so we we need to ensure that they're accurate, that uh, they're working properly, and they're replaced on a on a regular basis. So we're going to be starting that program at the same time to account for that. Um, Russ, yes. um, did, is this going to result in a reduced FTE? Uh, we're we're going to we're going to utilize them elsewhere. Right now, the FTE only spends about a day and a half reading water meters, and so it provides additional customer service to the community. Uh, we can check for water leaks. We can assist people. Uh, your, the hose on the back of your washing machine breaks, and you can't shut the water off. Who do you call? It's not Ghostbusters. Uh, so it, it does provide additional customer service to the community and allows us to utilize that that staff additional time we gain elsewhere. Will this have any impact on the equal pay option? 
that I assume some customers are using, and is that beneficial for the city uh, in terms of in terms of usage accuracy? Um, can you ask your question again? I'm not sure I understand. So it. is the equal pay option, uh, I guess the first question is how many people are using the equal pay option? We have quite city? a few actually on equal pay. And does the modernization of the meters provide benefit to the city in order to have accurate uh, income uh, relative to the current form? Yeah, it does actually. It does. I mean, either way, we were still getting the reads, but it does definitely help with the equal pay and it helps a lot with the leak adjustments because we're able to catch it a lot quicker than a week later. That's really the biggest benefit for these. One, one of the things that we have in our meters, that's a tiny little chip, it records the past 30 days of usage. So we can actually go in and draw that information out off the chip and our technicians do that uh, to pull it back in there. So we're, we've become much more accurate. We used to be in the neighborhood of 85% accuracy. We're now well within the American Water Works Association standard of being in that 98.5% accuracy. Okay. Other, other questions on? Go on. Go along. On maintenance. Uh, no more questions. Move no. along. We'll go to stormwater. Is everybody tired of it raining? Uh, our stormwater, our stormwater system uh, that we have is again carryover from the early uh, 1900s. Uh, from town, we have a lot of old pipe in town. We really haven't focused uh, tremendously on it. When it rains, it goes down a pipe, it goes away. But as we continue to uh, build out the city uh, and make improvements, we're going to add over this next year and a half. We're going to add additional focus on our stormwater system, taking a look at it, fixing deficiencies in that. We've discovered several areas in town that have issues when we have heavy rainfall or continuous rainfall, and we're going to start addressing some of those issues to where it floods people's areas, yards, businesses, uh, and dealing with that. So that's that's one of our main uh, things on this. Again, the stormwater, our fees come from uh, the municipal statement and, and user fees, and, and we really can't meter it, so it's it's based on an equivalency. Um, engineering, uh, some of our expenses, again, our major expense is the internal charge to support all the other functions that support us. Um, and, it, and we're working towards, again, collapsing some of those numbers that we have in there. Pretty static. Our stormwater maintenance, uh, that's where we're gonna focus on it. We have set a plan in motion several years ago to take a look at our wastewater piping and collection system, both cleaning and internal televised inspection on the camera down the pipe. We've only done it occasionally with our wastewater system. We are now moving to do that with our wastewater uh, piping, to get in, to clean them, to ensure that they operate, uh, to inspect them and make repairs. Uh, a lot of places you see water bubble up next to the curb when it rains. And we are the town of what we call bubblers. Um, eons ago, they used to put a drain on one side, a catch basin on one side that was higher and one on the other side and pipe between the two. And instead of the water running across the road, it ran through the pipe and bubbled up on the other side. There is no stormwater piping there other than that. Uh, and if you add all the streets up in a row, pretty soon by the time it gets down there, we've got significant problems. Uh, there used to be a company in Newburgh called the Newburgh Basement Drainage Company that was a private enterprise providing drain pipes for basements, which got incorporated into our city stormwater system. It's vitrified clay pipe. If anybody knows anything about vitrified clay, it's, it's like a flower pot. It looks really good until you touch it and then it breaks. Um, and so we're taking a look at, at many of these areas and that's gonna be an additional focus on that to help us address some of the stormwater issues that we have in town. Uh, we've had a couple of major ones. We're in the process of doing some engineering to address those, uh, but that's that's a major focus that we have. One of the other things that we have is, is everybody drives around, you'll notice all of the stormwater facilities that we have alongside the roads, uh, in areas, 
to treat the runoff as were required by the state and the federal government to remove those particulates and contaminants from our stormwater before it gets into streams. Uh, a few years ago, we didn't have any. How many do we have now, Preston? 135. 135 stormwater facilities. These all have plants. These all have to be maintained. And so that's an additional uh, issue that we are facing is they will function perfectly for a few years and then they quit working altogether. And so we have to, to ramp up our maintenance activities on that. And so we're taking a look at the uh, addition of an FTE to help us with that. We know all along since this started that this was gonna happen and we've, we've carried on as long as we can. We've through efficiencies been able to carry that on, but at this point in time, we've reached the end of the rope, so to speak. Um, so this is one of the things that we are gonna address. We do have pretty good discharge quality of our, of our stormwater into the receiving streams, Hess Creek, Shalem Creek, uh, and the Willamette River. But this is an issue that is not being only faced by us, but all the communities along the Willamette. And it's it's being mandated that we have uh, take action on this and follow some of the requirements that the state has placed on us for this. So uh, that's a focus that we have in our stormwater maintenance that's on there. During the summer, uh, you know, it's out of sight, out of mind. Uh, when it doesn't, when it doesn't rain, you know, when it doesn't, uh, drain, then everybody wants, wants something done about it right away. And what we're going to try to do is work on it year round so that we don't get to that point. And so just to, whoops, just to go off of that, um, we have two new FTEs for Utility Tech 1 and Utility Tech 2 that are partial stormwater and partial wastewater, just of where they're going to be doing their work. And these positions were also a, a net effect of zero because we cut several things. Um, you can see we cut the capital outlay line here in the stormwater. There were other capital projects that we had cut to fund these FTE because of the necessary things. Re that requirements on that. And the, and, the, and the great thing is stormwater, wastewater, they're all pipes. They all carry gravity flow. They're very similar in what they do, except one's a lot cleaner than the other one, and you pick. <laughs> So you're talking about um, the, the um, catch water pond things next to subdivisions. So when you say that they don't work after a few years, is it just because they've filled up with silt? So is one of these employees going to be just going with a backhoe or something and cleaning those things out? You, you have to go in and rehabilitate them. If you take a look at the structure, it's actually a it's like a specific gravity filter. It's a large gravel and then you've got a media and then you got media on top of it and plant growth. A lot of these plants are planted in there simply because they will take up the heavy metals, the you know cattails, uh, rushes will absorb a lot of these these contaminants right into the into the body. They also grow, and the root mass will grow up and bind the the drainage that's in there. And so over a period of time, you have to go in, remove them. If anybody's got irises and let them grow forever, you know how things grow together and binds things up. So we have to go in and rehabilitate it, put new media in. We've had to do it a couple of times uh, to do that, to make sure they continue to work and function properly. And the other thing about this FTE change, although, as I said, it's, as it was said, it's funded from some other cuts, it actually creates another efficiency because it enables us to break our technicians into two teams by having two teams that can work at opposite ends of the week they'll have deeper schedules that represents less opportunities for callbacks, less opportunities for overtime, and it will actually be more efficient. So we'll hope to see less overtime and less callbacks over a year. Sorry, ask me. That's great. Thank you. Along. All right. We're going to four. I think that that's actually all I had for tonight. I know. <laughs> wow. Three cheers to our chair. Hip, hip, so, hooray. Okay. So, so we will continue next. Next, uh, I know you were, you're going to talk about that, but just so that I'm clear here where we paused, we paused at fund four. four. Yeah, okay. Um, I will now open the floor to public comment. Sue, did we receive any public comments? 
Uh, no, we did not receive any for tonight either. I didn't get any email and there's no public here to speak. No public to speak here? <laughs> Great. If none, then uh, I will now close the public comment ses session. Katie, can you please go over the next week's meeting with us? Yes. So next week, we're going to talk about the two capital project funds, Fund 4 and Fund 18. We're going to go over all of the SDC funds. So that's Fund 42, Fund 43, 46, and 47. And then we're going to go over the miscellaneous funds. So Fund 9, 19, 21, 22, and 99. And then we'll have just another general discussion before we go for the approval of the budget. And then we will also be discussing the property tax levy and approving the property tax levy as well. Okay, so if no one has further questions, uh, the budget, oh, yes, you do. I don't have a question. The only thing I'd like to do is recognize, introduce and recognize my management team from Public Works that uh, helped work on this. Uh, Dan Wilson, our, our water treatment plant superintendent, Karen Hoffman, our city engineer, uh, Sarah Wilson, our assistant city engineer, uh, Karen Tyrmichael, who's our emergency preparedness coordinator, and Preston Langlers, who's our maintenance superintendent, and Craig Pack, who is on vacation. Good for him. <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, uh, all that you guys do. So now that there is no uh, further comments, uh, the budget committee meeting is now adjourned at 746. Please eat some food.